Yiridu Murang Maji, Ray Johnston, Yuanadi, Wiradjuri, Yina Baladu. Hello, friends. My name is Ray Johnston. I am the science and technology editor for NITV and SBS, and I'm a science gallery Leonardo, which is awesome. I'm also a Wiradjuri woman, but I was born and raised on Darug and Gundagara country, where a lot of my family still lives today, and that's where I have a lot of responsibilities to care for country. Now, it's vital that we not only acknowledge but also understand what it means to be living on the unceded lands of the sovereign First Nations people of this country, people whose rich and diverse cultures survive in spite of attempts to erase them, demonstrating the power and resilience of the world's oldest continuing cultures. And it is with that sentiment that I acknowledge and show my respect to the Gadigal, whose land it is that I'm on today, and I pay my deepest respect to their elders past and present. I ask you all watching to do the same. And I extend that respect to my First Nations brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles that are also here with us this evening. Now, this time last year, we were already months into the most intense bushfire season this country has ever seen. And more and more, I saw people turning to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge for solutions. And tonight, Associate Professor Michael Sean Fletcher and I are going to be discussing first people's cultural burning traditions as scientific practice and also the role of Indigenous futurism. We're going to not only imagine a future where Indigenous knowledge has radically changed the threat of climate change, we're also going to talk about what needs to happen to get us there. So please share the conversation online. We are using the hashtag flames of opportunity and be sure to tag the Science Gallery Melbourne. That's at, at SCI Gallery M-E-L. But first, we do have a short video from Martin Carlson at the Hugh, Wil Hugh Williamson Foundation to play. Hello there and good afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. My name is Martin Carlson and I'm involved the foundation in Melbourne, the Hugh Williamson Foundation, who was a man who worked very hard in his life, mainly through banking circles, but then he established a fund, which some of us have been fortunate enough to exercise for him the tasks that he wanted and indicated. We are honoured that it appears to be a Williamson lecturer, established at the parts of Melbourne that suit it, particularly, particularly the Science Gallery. And the attitudes are to search out where we can to endeavour to support what the university is doing in Science Gallery as our other organisations. And in that quite wonderful spot it's got on in Carlton, it's not quite as special as this, this spot is in our garden in, in other parts of the city, but it's there as a real force. It's there as an honest, true thing. The Hugh Williamson Foundation is a long-time supporter of the Science Gallery Mel Melbourne. Thank you, Martin. Now, I am joined tonight by Associate Professor Michael Sean Fletcher, who is a Wiradjuri man. Uh, he's also a physical geography researcher and Assistant Dean Indigenous Faculty of Science at the University of Melbourne. He's also Director of Research Capability at the Indigenous Knowledge Institute. Now, Michael Sean, I might start by actually asking you to tell me a little bit about the Indigenous Knowledge Institute. What happens there? Yeah. Hi, Ray. Thanks for having me. I'd also like to acknowledge um, country. I'm on uh, Wurundjeri country now. I've come from Boomerang country today over Birrarung and in the office to try and uh, get on the good internet. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm a Wurundjeri man. I was also born and raised on other people's country in Boomerang country and I still live there today, but trust me, I have moved occasionally. <laughs> um, so the Indigenous Knowledge Institute is a new research institute at the University of Melbourne, which is framed or focused on advancing Indigenous knowledge, not only in the academy, but in society. And it's also focused on engaging appropriately and meaningfully with Indigenous communities uh, across Australia um, so that we can start to look at the world in different ways and uh, tackle some of our major uh, challenges in society in different ways. Particularly, this is particularly relevant for Australia where 
imported paradigms of, say, land management and how to, to live on this continent uh, continue today to cause serious problems. And as you mentioned earlier, the 2019-2020 bushfires are a product of that uh, failure to recognise where we live and learn the lessons from Indigenous knowledge. So the Indigenous Knowledge Institute is not only focused on Australian Indigenous knowledge, we have an international focus as well, embedded in the same notions and recognising the UN Charter on, on Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledge. Sounds pretty awesome. Now, I'd like to start by going back to the beginning, actually. What sparked your interest in science? Were you a geeky kid like me? Yeah, well, I grew up uh, in a city, but my father was from a bit north of Bendigo in Victoria and judge over our own country. Uh, and we spent a lot of time in the bush. And I spent a lot of time you know, doing things that are probably inappropriate now in an environmental context, you know, sticking my hand in hollow logs and playing with baby birds and doing all this sort of stuff and spending a lot of time out, out on country, out in the bush and developed a big passion for the natural world. And actually, I, I always aspired to be a, a wildlife cinematographer or something like that. I was always really interested in, in the natural world or the world around us. Um, and I went to university, actually studied to be a teacher at university, um, majoring in science and doing genetics and didn't really turn me on that much intellectually. I, I found, whilst I think genetics is, is an awesome and amazing discipline, for me it was a little too abstract. I I'm, was very much a landscape person and a big picture person. So wandering around and had the latitude to do so in the University of Melbourne, which is an amazing uh, academic institution, I found geography subjects, which really clicked everything into place. It sort of embedded my micro knowledge of genes and cells and all this sort of stuff with the big picture of people, climate and landscapes. Sounds like you've got a you know, background that's really hands-on. So what inspired you to go into research? Sort of didn't, like most people, I guess, you know, a bit of the Benjamin Button situation, you, you never know what you really want to be. Um, but when I started doing these geography subjects and, and started thinking about some of the environmental problems that the world faces today, and particularly the one my research was on, um, landscapes, Australian landscapes, and understanding that a large part of the problem was the removal of our mob, removal of Aboriginal people from landscapes. And it really just clicked on, it switched on the engine in my brain. I, of course, then went traveling and did all sorts of things that young people do and came back and, and picked up the research career, you know, full tilt. I always knew that I wanted to go back to it. It really sparked a passion. So, and I haven't, haven't really looked back since then. Can you tell me a little bit about your current research and what it tells us about historical Indigenous fire practice in Australia? Yeah, okay, so I'll go into a bit more detail when I give a bit of a spiel later on. But I, I'm sort of embedded in the notion that to understand the contemporary world around us, we have to understand the past. That the present is a product of, of processes that are going on now, but also processes that are gone in the past that have led to the conditions we have now. So my research looks at delving in deeper than what, say, traditional uh, neo-ecology or, or recent ecology looks at, which is, you know, say, maximum 50, 60 years of, of ecological data that's really finally resolved and really important for understanding processes. But a lot of the changes that we see and a lot of the, the rhythms that organisms live to and that humans operate at uh, exceed that time frame. They beat to a slower drum, some beat to a faster drum, and we miss a lot of information just by looking at that relatively short term window. So my research seeks to plunge into the earth, if you like, and, and unpack the stories recorded in the sediments in the earth. So I extract sediment cores mainly, or I'll extract uh, tree cores, cores out of the centers of trees to understand how they've grown through time and when they become established. And through that, I, in the sediments, I unpack all sorts of things. So I've had students unpack little aquatic organisms. Uh, we pull charcoal out of it that tells us about fire, pollen, which tells us about vegetation, geochemistry, which tells us about erosion and other things like that. And by sequentially analyzing a core through time, you can piece together landscape change through time. And that can give you an understanding of where you are in that sequence of historical events and what's actually led, what are the true drivers that have led to the current situation that you're in? I'd love for you to touch on the wilderness myth and why it's so important that we bust it. Yeah, okay, I'll also touch on this um, a little bit in, in the, 
talk I'll give. But I'm ruining your presentation, no, aren't I? No, that's fine. It's uh, <laughs> repetition is the key to uh, success. So um, I think there's a big problem here. We're, we're situated in a landscape in which people arrived at least 65 to 68,000 years ago who are very skilled land managers and have been very skilled land managers since the evolution of Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago, modern humans. Um, and as humans do, as every single human does when entering into a landscape or living in a place, we seek to manipulate our environment to create predictability and create security. And that manipulation has a profound impact on the world around us. And we know this just from when we drive in the countryside and all this sort of stuff, and we see these farms and all this sort of stuff where it's, it's uh, not what you, you just know inherently that that's not the inverted commas natural state of the landscape. And I have a problem with that word natural, but we'll move on. Um, and I think the term Australia has been managed for, for 65, 68,000 years. And a lot of the places that are actually landscapes that are created and constructed by people are considered wildernesses. You know, we have the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area. We have modern definitions of Madu country in the Northwestern deserts as wilderness, all of this sort of stuff. And the, the definition, as I'll show you later, of wilderness is a landscape that is essentially operating in the absence of human activity. So it's a dehumanizing uh, concept. Not only a dehumanizing, it's very dangerous in that if you take a landscape that has been managed for millennia and actively lock out people, based on a misguided paradigm of wilderness, you end up with a lot of environmental problems and essentially an unravelling of the Australian ecosystem. I think it's time to duck into your presentation now, okay. if you're ready, Michael. We'd love to, before I ask all the questions and, and yeah, ruin yeah, everything, let's kind of forget yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, great question, very uh, prescient. I'd, okay. I'd, I'd, I'd love to see what you have to say so that I can uh, not spoil it. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to take you through a little bit of concepts that Ray and I have just briefly touched on and dig into them a bit deeper. So thanks, Ray, for introducing them. It was important. Um, I'd also like to take you a little through about what it is that I do, you know, what my unit of study is, and then some of the ways in which this has helped us reimagine re and reconceptualise the landscapes we live in, and also how um, the arrival or the invasion of the British into the Australian continent and the arrival of a new landscape management paradigm, how that's impacted not only bushfires, but also Australian ecosystems. So if we think about fire, and this is essentially about fire, this talk, we know that it has three main levers, if you like, a fire triangle. There's an ignition, there's the fuel, which in, at a landscape scale is vegetation. And fire needs oxygen, but oxygen's been sort of constant in the atmosphere for the last 100 million, if not more, years so we can extract oxygen out and what determines whether a fire occurs is how wet or dry the condition of the fuel which is determined by climate the landscape scale so people humans and we are all humans we're all different cultures but we are all humans uh, pull the levers of ignition and vegetation okay uh, and climate operates and even though we're we're changing climate now uh, I don't think anyone yet has argued that humans are willfully pulling the lever of climate in a deliberate kind of way. Now, humans for 1.7 million years have been using fire. Okay, so our progenitors, Australopithecines, right through the, the genus Homo, right up to Homo sapiens, have mastered fire. Not only mastered when fire occurs, where it occurs, the array of fuels in a landscape, all of these sorts of things. You could argue that fire has been our greatest tool and one of our greatest influences. And here's a plot on the right that sort of shows the natural, in absence of human activity, fire uh, productivity slash moisture gradient in really wet productive landscapes, let's say rainforests, fire occurs very infrequently. In very dry desert landscapes, there's not much fuel, fire occurs infrequently. And there's a sweet spot here, a humped relationship. What humans do when they get into a, a landscape is we start to change when fires occur. Okay? Natural ignitions in rainforest environments might not occur uh, very often. So humans will select dry periods and seek to burn. They introduce fire into these areas. They might fragment uh, fuel uh, condition, fuel cover, all these sorts of things that allow fires to get in. We actively suppress fire in this hump zone because it's out of control. And we essentially 
increase through irrigation fuels in dry landscapes. So we completely warp this natural relationship with fire. We are experts at fire. We're a fire organism. Not only do we use fire to master landscapes, it has profoundly changed who we are. It's unlocked the fuel potential of our brain, powering this really energy expensive organ in our, in our head, okay, that we really require fire to provide enough energy to our brain from our food. It's provided us with the ability to do things outside of the diurnal cycle, the daylight cycle, which is a requirement of a big socially demanding brain. Okay, this, this runs through our progenitors up to modern humans and the amount of social time required to service our brain. And it's just not enough hours in the day if you're procuring food and the ability to master fire, have fires, sit around a campfire, have that social time has facilitated the servicing of our brain and realizing its potential. And that's present in conversations. Daytime conversations vary significantly from nighttime conversations. And nighttime conversations are filled with abstract stories. And our ability to think abstractly and develop plans and all these sorts of things is related to our mastery of fire. So we're a fire organism. And we know in Australia that fire has been a tool which Aboriginal people have profoundly shaped and managed the landscape in a really deep kind of way. But we are quite often lack empirical data on this, which is where I step in. Okay, so we know that fire use is, is done through this thing called cultural burning, which is an intimate and reflexive uh, method, requires feet on the ground relationship with country, okay, sensory experience with country. It's based on cues in the environment, okay. It's performed under strict cosmological and kinship protocols for a range of reasons that are spiritual, pragmatic, economic, ritual, all sorts of reasons. But it has a few net effects. The net effect is increased biodiversity, okay? We know and ecological models know that if you burn in small little patches of different frequencies, you create across a landscape, a heterogeneous landscape that results in high uh, diversity across that landscape. As a consequence also, you reduce landscape scale fuel loads, you reduce the connection between the ground and the canopy, which is critical for bushfires. Fires almost invariably start on the ground, if they rush up to a canopy, they become a problem. In managed land, in managed country, you see very low connectivity between ground and, and canopy. Our mob also protects fire sensitive ecosystems. We use colitis, say, in the Northern Territory for honey. We use spears, we all these sorts of things where we wanna actively protect, okay? And fundamentally, it provides a connection to country, okay, that results in improved livelihoods and lives. And this is the state of play in Australian landscapes. I mean, pick through this, but this is the diversity of fire regimes across the Australian continent you know, that people were living in. An immensely diverse landscape tuned into different fire regimes. And we know, and I don't like this map because it's an example of a white person who appropriate Aboriginal knowledge, but it is powerful and to say that this was an occupied and is an occupied continent by Aboriginal people. So this isn't this longevity of existence of a fire-wielding organism, a sophisticated, intelligent fire-wielding uh, organism, us, occupying every square inch of a landscape that is tuned into fire, has forgiven us the fire regimes we see today. And also something that we should note about the Indigenous estate is that it sits on some of the most ecologically in, uh, uh, healthy country in Australia. Now, these might be a bit dated, these maps, but they're still reflective in the general pattern. This is the Indigenous state on the right hand side. This is invasive species on the left hand side. The Indigenous owned estate today, where Indigenous either run or own or manage country. Deforestation, the least deforested country. And the most, the highest river health. And these, these lists go on and on and on. Aboriginal people today own and manage the healthiest country in Australia. So I wanna unpack this notion of wilderness, which is a countercurrent that flows through Australian society. This is a paper from 2018 where the, there were efforts to technically define what a wilderness was. And you'll notice that there's a big patch of wilderness sitting there in Australia. So what does wilderness mean? Okay, wilderness is an uncultivated, uninhabited, inhospitable region, okay? Uh, wilderness usually uh, are natural environments on earth that have not been significantly modified by human activity. Okay, it comes from the old English the place of wild beasts. And in the, just as an example, in the US Wilderness Act in 1964, the wilderness is an area on earth where its community and life are untrammeled by man, humans. 
where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. And it's affected primarily to fought by the forces of nature with the imprint of man's work substantially unnoticeable. That's an interesting point, substantially unnoticeable. What do we mean by that? Western cultures see this as landscape modification, as influenced by people. This is what a modified landscape looks like. This is what a human cultural landscape looks like. Not this, you know, not this sort of Western European mindset. Now, if we actually look at the uh, history of the usage of the word wilderness, it surged in the British lexicon, lexicon as, there, as places across the earth were colonized, invaded and colonized. Okay, so it reveals here that the word is inherently subjective and has a cultural position. And the latest movement of uh, wilderness movement is pretty much directly in response to the industrial revolution and our uh, recognition that some kinds of cultural practice significantly impact in a negative way the world around us. And so these are, the use of wilderness is a response to a cultural observation. It's not an objective truth. So if we look here at this um, technical definition of wilderness, you can see they use eight indicators of human pressures, built environments, croplands, pasture lands, population density, nighttime lights, railways, major roadways, and navigable waterways. Very discrete and culturally biased terms around what human pressures or human indicators are. And in an act of abject hypocrisy at the end of this paper, they say that wilderness regions are home to some of the most politically and economically marginalized indigenous communities on earth. So they're calling the homes of humans wilderness, a place where humans have no influence. And it's a, it's a defunct term that I think really needs to be scrapped. And if we look here at the Maru country, this area here in the Western deserts, is an artist rendition by a bunch of Maru women who, who uh, have drawn clan estates, management patches and hunting tracks across the country. There's anything but a, an unmanaged country. And they managed for the quasi kind of decadal burning regime. Um, and I'm aware of the time, but I think that a very important lesson can be learned from some scientific analysis of this country. Um, here we have Maru country in the top left managed by Maru people. In the bottom left, areas are here where colonization resulted in the removal of Aboriginal people from the Western deserts. If we play the tape on fire, through here over a 10 year period. I want you to watch a couple of things. The size of the fires, which is this Y axis, the number of fires here, the area burnt and the ecological diversity in each country. And I'll play it through and we'll look at what happens in the end. This is over a decade. You should be noticing something about the fire size difference in the images and the spread of burns across different age cohorts of recovery. In managed country, there are smaller areas burnt across a range of cohorts. In unmanaged country, there are huge stochastic fires. And in the end, you have almost half the diversity in the unmanaged country than you do in the managed country. You have an infinitely number more fires on Madu country, but almost half the area burnt. Take people out of country, catastrophic wildfires, low diversity, species extinction. Put people in country, high diversity, low area burnt, lots of fires, healthy country and healthy people. Okay, and so what are the effects of the British invasion? We see it all over the shop. Okay, here's Uluru, just after Aboriginal management ended. Um, Aboriginal traditional Aboriginal prior to the removal of uh, mob. Spin effects grasslands replaced by Kenapog grasslands, a shrubbiness, increase in shrubbiness. We look at artist renditions, here's Lake Surprise or Budge Bim in Western Victoria, painted by Eugene von Gerard, a phenomenological paper who's highly regarded for his landscape accuracy. Open, closed. Mount Gambia, open to closed. Another one from Mount Gambia, open to closed, the other crater on Mount Gambia. What does this mean for this notion of wilderness? Let's pick on uh, one of the most famous wilderness areas in Australia, the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, where I've done a lot of work. It's a beautiful country. There's, it's been made famous by these photos, which ended up saving the place from uh, the dam, dam mad 
uh, Liberal government through recognition of its natural values and some cultural values. But the main thing here is it's called a wilderness and considered a wilderness in which people are actively excluded from the ecology of the place. And it's facing in recent times, serious threats from catastrophic wildfire, serious threats. And what we know about the place is far from being a rainforested landscape, it's an open country. And we know ecologically, if we look at this picture here, the ecological succession model here to maintain open country, you need to burn. You need to burn at least at 10 year intervals in this country to keep it open. So we have vast areas of open landscape, 40% of this landscape's open, about 20% is rainforest. And then we're talking about the infertile country here, same thing on fertile country, just that you need to burn even more frequently. So what's going on here? How is this wilderness area, an open landscape that requires fire in a landscape that receives almost three and a half metres of rainfall a year? and in which usually, up until the last couple of uh, lightning storms, you have uh, lightning strikes accompanied with too much rain to start fires. What's happening? Well, first of all, there's a, a myth of wilderness that is persisting since Colonel, Arthur, General, uh, Colonel George Arthur, the first governor of Tasmania, who uh, in true European form perceived the Western Tasmanian landscape as not sort of a place that he'd like to live in or anyone would like to live in. So he named it Transylvania. Okay, after obviously the inhospitable country of uh, Gondracula. So this is perpetuated through into archeological maps. Okay, archeology span is relatively biased, quite often focused on caves because you know, we know where caves are. Finding archeology span in open country is a lot more difficult, especially open country like Tasmania, which is mountainous and can be wet a lot of the time. And is a place that Europeans wouldn't want to live in. So this area was considered unoccupied by a mob, by people. Now this area, which is you have open, vegetation dominating, uh, where rainforests should be in the absence of uh, frequent fire, was unoccupied by people, according to the archeologists. And that area maps straight onto the wilderness area. And this is rooted in this notion that um, was going around when, we were, when Australia was invaded by whitefellas, Darwin was doing his thing and social Darwinism took hold and Aboriginal people were considered missing links, if you like, subhuman. So no humanity was granted to them. You know, and we see these quotes of Darwin wanting the skulls of the last remaining Tasmanians. We see New York uh, Times post saying Stone Age man discovered in, in Tasmania, all of this sort of stuff. These were not considered humans. We were not considered humans. So how could we do what humans do? So how do we get a better understanding of the past? Use paleoecology. So I look in the sediments, I pick up this long-term trends, which can pick up amplitudes that exceed our observation window. I generally focus on lake sediments. Is one on the right-hand side, a core of mine. Obviously a big change occurred here in the environment and we can unpack what that change was. I pull all sorts of things out of the, of the, the sediment. Um, I thought I'd show you a quick video uh, and narrate it as I go. This is kind of what I do when I'm out in the field. I find this is a, this rainforest we're driving through now was in 1827 when it was surveyed by a whitefellow, an open grassland that was actively burnt and lived in by Aboriginal people, okay? So quite often driving into, you know, pretty remote kind of places, find a place where there's some sediment and take a core using this uh, a coring device. And here we've got seven meters of sediment out of here that stretch back 17,000 years. So we can understand how this landscape's changed. You can see this is open because water was, it sits here most of the year and the forest has moved in all around this country. Uh, sometimes we need to actively push these things down quite, quite forcefully. Uh, here's another open country site in the same landscape. Um, we find these sediments and you can see in this core here, there's a, a change towards the bottom there that shows us there's been a significant environmental change at this site. Here's another site, a million year old meteor crater that I called that turned into a lake for, for nearly 800,000 years. We had to helicopter in a really heavy duty drill rig into to pull this out. This is really heavy duty, sophisticated kind of work to get the, the sediment out of these things. This is a geological drill rig with a diamond head drill bit to get through the upper layers and then into the old lake sediments, which stretch down for 70 meters or so. Um, you know, helicopter support, multiple helicopters helping, helping put together the drilling platform. Um, you know, really geological uh, scale equipment. Um, we kept the sediments dark because we were using things like optically stimulated luminescence, a technique to date these sediments that depends on 
light exposure. So we didn't want to expose the sediments to light, obviously detailed notes and everything like that are taken. And then we shipped the cores out after about a week and a half, two weeks living out on, in the middle of uh, uh, Palawa country, which is no one goes to anymore. Other places, here's uh, Cradle Mountain in Tasmania, we row our platform out to, bang things in, I do all the work, my students sit there and do nothing, have a bit of a snooze. Um, and then when we get the mud back to the lab, we split it with um, a device that allows us to get a very flat surface so we can take it to the Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organisation to do some nuclear scanning techniques on it, wrap it so it doesn't lose moisture, sample at the intervals that we're interested in, excavate the sediment, treat it to a whole bunch of different uh, chemicals so we can extract our desired um, component um, using you know, centrifuges and and all these sorts of things to extract and all sorts of chemicals. And we end up with, in the pollen sense, a slide that contains pollen that was floating around. And this one here was about 70,000 years ago. I also use tree rings in which we core into these trees. It's quite hard work, but they give you a nice column of, of material that is contains growth rings on the right trees. Um, systematically survey forest stands. Um, you sand them back, buff them up, and then you can measure the growth rings, count the number of rings, and it can tell you all sorts of information about the growth patterns and when these trees established. It can tell you about landscape change and those kinds of things. Okay, so if we want to understand what happened when the Palawa, the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, arrived into Tasmania, we need to know when they arrived. Okay, so here, the way that they got into, it, into Tasmania was through the lowering of sea level through an ice age or through ice ages. Ice ages have been waxing and waning for the last few million years at different rhythms. Early on in the piece, it was a 40,000 year rhythm. Now we're about a 100,000 year rhythm. Um, we have, uh, during a interglacial, the time that we're living in now, polar ice caps melt, uh, landscape, uh, water falls into the ocean and raises sea level and disconnects continental islands like Tasmania. Hence, we have to get the spirit of Tasmania. There was no spirit of Tasmania when people arrived into uh, Australia 65,000 years ago. They occupied all of Australia. We're definitely on the south coast of Australia by at least 40 to 50,000 years ago, awaiting the time to cross, essentially. Um, then there were periods of time that were available for crossing at discrete uh, moments. And here, zero, and it's going to flip around in the next slide, I'm sorry. Go back 140,000 years ago, you could get in to Tasmania. Then the, the sill was not exposed, okay? You could not cross, it's a treacherous ocean. Around about uh, 65,000 years ago, you could get across, but people had just arrived in the top end at that point in time. You couldn't get across, and then around about 43,000 years ago, you could start to cross, and then we plunge into the last ice age where you could definitely cross. Then we exit into what we're calling the Holocene or the current interglacial, the period we live in, when it was uh, severed. Uh, again, and essentially isolating people in Tasmania for the last 15,000 years, 10,000 years. So what happened? We see archaeology appearing in Tasmania immediately when that sill is exposed. People are there flooding into the country, or arriving. I don't know, flooding. I don't know how many people are coming across, but enough people to occupy caves and start living. These caves down here in the southwest, the country that I'm talking about, the wilderness world heritage area. They arrived into a grassed landscape. Through ice ages, temperature depresses trees, grasses flourish, and the yellow here is grass dominant, and oranges and gr greens are forest dominant and shrubs dominant. You can see here back 140,000 years ago, there's rhythms, which is sort of global temperature change. We plunge into the last ice age. People arrive somewhere in this phase. It's not very well dated, this record. Then the last ice age ends, and the grasses are replaced by trees. So people arrived into a grassy landscape. What did they do? Okay, so looking at this site here, so only a better minute this video, I found us, managed to find a site that has sediment going back, and this might not sound that great to you guys, but it's pretty amazing in Tasmania where glaciers reset the landscape, they scrape them out, and you essentially start from zero every ice age. Here's a site that managed to escape in the critical zone we're talking about, uh, ice for at least 230,000 years. And the other thing I want you to note here is there's no forest here. This is open country. This is open country that requires fire. Okay, there's patches of forest, but it's dominated by open vegetation, fire requiring vegetation. So this site, Lake Salina, was an amazing site. 
This is 270,000 years to present. Okay, here's the axis here. Okay, I just want you to focus on this one here, archaeological dates. This is when people first arrived into Tasmania and they started when we find the first archaeology. Okay? Then this one here, Poaceae, that's grass. They're the grasses that animals like to eat. The archaeology shows us through us analysing uh, isotopes in teeth enamel of different animals that Aboriginal people were farming, essentially farming wallaby and wombats at different times of the year up in the inland caves, okay? Targeting a seasonal occupation, moving back out to the coast uh, in the winter. What happens to grass content in the landscape? when people arrive. So grasses increase every ice age. Here, I'm gonna bracket the ice ages. Here there's an ice age, here there's an ice age, here there's an ice age. What do you notice about the ice age in which after people have arrived? They have converted this here to standard deviations, which is what statisticians do. Anything above two standard deviations is generally considered a significant, a significant deviance. This Significant deviance shows that as soon as people arrive, there is significantly more grass in the landscape than there has been over the last 270,000 years. Yeah, 270,000 years. There's more grass in this landscape as soon as people arrive. Then what happens when people leave? Oh, sorry, when the ice age ends. Not people leave, people never left. Here on the right hand side, you have a transition from an ice age to not an ice age when people weren't there. Okay, we know that people weren't there. You can see that these cold climate things, grasses and things decrease, rainforest takes over, comes up to about 80% of the content of the vegetation. Fires there, you know, probably a dry landscape, probably getting some uh, fire, clearly getting some fires. When the rainforest comes in, locks fire out. There's very little, if any, fire. Add people into the mix, go from an ice age to not an ice age. Cold climate taxi, grasses, things decrease. Rainforest only gets to about 40% of the landscape, yeah? And this other kind of vegetation comes in. And this is the open vegetation that I've been showing you time and time again, the fire acquiring vegetation that dominates Tasmania today. And that's this moorland cultural landscape. You look through here, it's virtually absent throughout the entire 270,000 years until the shift into the current uh, climate interval, the Holocene. You've got people in the landscape burning, boom, it takes over the landscape. And the important thing to see here is that you have some fire in the, in the glacial when people are there, it persists through the modern climate conditions when previously it had disappeared. And we've repeated this analysis in the older records and it's always the sequence. Fire disappears when the rainforest moves in, but in every site that we have when people are there, rainforest fails to move in and fire stays around. So this is not a wilderness landscape. This is a landscape that was constructed by people was made by people. So then what happens when people were removed in, by 1835? We'd move up to the Northwest, a fertile site where we actually get uh, true grasses. Down here, you can see true grasses need even more work to keep as an open state. This landscape was described as open by Henry Hellier. Okay, this whole country here was described as open forest or grasslands. Now the remaining native vegetation is rainforest. How old is this rainforest? Well, using tree rings, we can see that no tree in this landscape has established before the British invasion. Every single rainforest tree, and these things live at least 500 years, if not 700 years, established after the British invasion. We've rolled that out, we've got 400 trees now. We found some old forest cores along rivers where there was some forest, but 90% of the trees in this country established after the British invasion. Rainforest expanded out. This wilderness landscape that we consider in this part of the country, the Tarkine, expanded out and leapt out onto indigenous cultural, culturally managed country. And the pollen shows the same thing. Here is old on the left, young on the right. There's lots of charcoal here when there's lots of eucalypts and lots of grasses. As soon as you remove charcoal, rainforest pollen moves in. You've gone from a Grassy eucalypt condition, as soon as European weeds move in, pastoral weeds, fire disappears, rainforest moves in. This is not a wilderness. This is repeated over and over again. I won't labour the point. This is site after site after site we go to shows the same thing. Okay, 
which has led me to sort of speculate that one way we can try and save this country is getting people back on country. Okay, and people can read this Mercury article if you want. But let's then think about what it tells us about bushfires very quickly. In the Tasmanian situation, first permanent British colony in 1803, warfare, major warfare between settlers and indigenous people. 1835, George Augustus Robinson declared the entire population had removed. We see that there's a massive expansion of trees following this. And we see that the first catastrophic bushfires in northern Tasmania occur from the 1850s to the 1890s. Okay, correlation isn't causation, may well be circumstantial, but it's a very, very uh, suggestive sequence of events. Stopped Aboriginal burning, trees expand right across the landscape, we start getting catastrophic fires. What about Southeast Australia? Top left, the red is the 2019-2020 fires. The green is a eucalypt forest estate, some of the most flammable forests on earth. On the right here, uh, Aboriginal massacres between 1790 and 1870 in this country. The bottom right are bushfires. Okay, and the first recorded bushfire in this country is 1850. Let's plot this in time. You can see here, there's a sequence of massacres of our people in Southeast Australia with Ray and my people in the Wiradjuri country, Southeast Australia, Ganai Kurnai, Jojo Wurrung, all these people were systematically uh, attempted to be removed from the landscape. It hasn't worked, we're still there, we're still strong on country, but it represents a significant uh, disruption to our management of this country. And then we see an increase in bushfires, importantly, that began prior to climate change. Okay, once again, correlation isn't causation and a temporal stacking isn't causation. Uh, and it's something that we've just got uh, quite a large grant to investigate, actually, um, whether these things are, are linked. But my suggestion is that they are. If we look here, we go up to southeast Queensland, managed country, unmanaged country. Okay, this is a country that's been wrestled back, so it still probably needs a bit more frequent burning. But you can see the impact of burning country at different regimes, what it does to fuel loads, what it does to vertical connectivity, all those kinds of things. But it's more than just fire. This is Australian extinctions, species extinctions through time that began immediately after invasion. Continues right through the series of massacres right across the continent and continues through to today. This is directly related to the change in management from Aboriginal land management to British management. Right. And there are large, some of the least impacted areas at the moment are the areas in which strong continual management has occurred up in the top end of lower species extinction. I'll just leave that because it's a very powerful graph um, to think about the impact of removing uh, Aboriginal people and Aboriginal management from country. And I haven't touched on here the reciprocity that in every measure taken of human health, psychological, physical um, uh, issues in, uh, with populations in various uh, communities, all improve when Aboriginal people are reconnected to the country and allowed to back onto country to manage country. There's a huge social dimension here that I, for the sake of time, haven't delved into. Um, obviously, there's so much to go into here, and I wish we had two hours, but we are limited, unfortunately. I do want to talk with you briefly about the future and how Indigenous fire practice can help us combat climate change. Would you like yeah, to so, help me with yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, what I wanted to do there was set the scene, because I don't think enough people appreciate the trajectory Australia's gone on, you know, and we can start, we can talk about returning cultural management, all this sort of stuff to country. But if people are completely ignorant, and a lot of people are, whether willfully or not, you know, no one's taught this in schools. No one's even taught that Aboriginal people were here in schools, really. You know, like it occasionally it pops in, you know, much to the chagrin of uh, certain sectors of the community, I imagine. But we need to understand, we need to appreciate the trajectory, with the path we've taken. It's not to guilt anyone into anything. It's to show you, look at, look at the facts. Look at the, the facts here. We need to look at the facts. And this has really fueled. you know, my efforts here are, to provide the empirical analysis for the stories our people tell, not to justify them, not to verify them, just to talk the language that some of the administrators should pay attention to. You know, we know from climate change that quite often administrators don't pay attention to science, but generally the whole the notion is that, that they do. So that's the purpose of that. And I think in the future, we need to get people back on country. You know, there's an urgent need 
in a lot of Southeast Australian country, a lot of everywhere, you're starting to see ecosystems unravel. You're starting to see, uh, I was talking to one of the elders out at Gunai Kurno today, lives out near now and now, and he was telling me vividly about how there's just more fires over the last few decades. He's an old fella. Like he has observed this, you know. We are experiencing more and more fires as country is drifting further and further away from the way that Aboriginal people kept it for millennia. And we need where we can to get back on country. There are examples of areas that were culturally managed or managed through cultural burning, being immune from the recent fires, the fires being missing them or being a lot less significant there. We need to step out of our antiquated notions of wilderness and what the environment looks like. Let go, let it go. Watch uh, Frozen and sort of take the song and just let it go. You know, like it's, it's a useless paradigm. Conservationists, you know, putting it all in the one basket, but are essentially the enemy to this. You know, the, the wilderness movement seeks to exclude people from a country that requires, and it, it requires that we're obliged to look after country. And Aboriginal people are the best place to do it. There's so much knowledge sitting out there, despite the, the fact that a lot of people say, well, the knowledge is lost. No, it's not. It's, it's sleeping, it needs to be awoken. You go out and you actually engage with people and you find that there is so much knowledge out there, even in the areas where you think uh, it's been lost. Look at Tasmania where purportedly genocide occurred. There are still people there with so much knowledge about how to manage country. And this is the way forward. If you manage in a, in a scientific sense, step outside of the social realm into the science, if you manage with fire, if you embrace fire, if you burn all the time, appropriate time, in response to the environmental cues, so you're not relying on a calendar, the season shift, temperature shift, moisture regime shift in a variable continent like Australia, looking for the environmental cues, what's flowering, what's not, what this feels like, all this sort of stuff, constantly burning, you don't have the huge pressure buildup that fuels bring and fuels just accumulate and accumulate and then bang, you get a huge fire. And this is the way forward. It's, uh, it's the way that we need to manage this country and we need to shift out of this combative idea with, country, with our country. You know, I'll just look at the fire brigade. What's brigade? It's a paramilitary term. I look at containment lines. I look at the organizational structure of the fire brigade. It's all par paramilitary. It's rooted in the notion that we can fight and defeat fire. It's not true. In this country, we need to use it as our greatest ally, as our tool, as our friend. You know, and you look at some languages, there's a really fascinating books on the, on the top end of it. There's dozens of words for the use of fire in, in, in language all sorts of tiny little nuances. It's so ingrained in culture. And that's, for me, is the way forward. Then you can get these, and we're not going to remove catastrophic fires. There are some ecosystems out there, Mount Nash, Alpine Ash, Delgatensis and Regnans, that require catastrophic fires. But they don't dominate the whole estate that just burnt the tiny pockets that require those catastrophic fires. We can't avoid the fact that we're going to get extreme fire weather that's going to promote fires and give us fires. That's going to happen. But if we've got a landscape where this fuels it, orders of magnitude lower, then that's going to buffer against those conditions. And we've got to do it now. We've got, really got to do it now. We are able to take questions from the audience now, and we do have a few in here already. Uh, this kind of turns that last question on its head, which is how has climate change impacted Indigenous fire management? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, the Aboriginal people, we've been living here for 65,000 years at least. There have been huge swings in climate. There have been huge swings in climate. You know, I can't, I haven't got a time machine, I'm sure mistakes are made, lessons are learned. That's what science is. Aboriginal people are scientists. We observe, we practice, learn from the observations, practice again. It's a long dance that's been going on, you know. Um, I think now, I think the really big danger now is a lot of these ecosystems that have drifted so far, we've got to be careful when we start reintroducing fire into them because they're so fuel laden. And then climate change is going to provide less windows of opportunity in the future where you can spend a a decade or, or five years or whatever wrestling control back over country and getting fire back in because it, it's not like one burn and you're done. It's a lifetime's work and it's a generation's of work and it's every day for the rest of our lives on this country, you know. Um, so climate change might make that a bit more difficult. It's definitely in influencing phenology and, you know, when things flower and all these sorts of things, shifting seasons. But that's why I think looking at environmental cues is so much more robust than just relying on, um, you know, predictive seasons and all of these sorts of things. It tells you the way, the condition of a country and the appropriate way to behave in country. So there's no doubt there's been an influence, but I don't think it's any kind of barrier. 
There's a question in here that also has an answer right underneath it. The question is, how do we awaken the knowledge? And uh, uh, another viewer this evening has said, we awaken the knowledge by resourcing and letting us Aboriginal mobs take the lead. Is yeah. that your line of thinking as well? Yeah, it is. You know, let us drive, like I love Victor, Victor Stephenson, and he, he talked in uh, a Q&A a little while ago, and he can't just let us drive the car for a while. And that's true, you know, like you can't, you can't stuff things up more than they are, I don't think. Um, but not only that, I think sitting down and listening and talking you know, not prejudging, not under, not thinking who is a knowledge holder, who isn't a knowledge holder. It's not a certificate that gives you knowledge. It's not a PhD or a PhD. You know, it doesn't give me knowledge. You know, like it's listening to people who have stories to tell. You know, and we what we do in, in science in the academy is we split things, split, 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 split. And I think we, you know, for, for want of a, a less uh, suggestive uh, term, we can't see the forest for the trees. You know, like we can't see the overall picture because we've got all these little rules we make up and all these sorts of little, you know, classifications and all this, and we can't see the whole picture. And I think, you know, sitting down and listening to people who see things differently uh, is a really important way forward and of reawaking that knowledge. And then I agree with your, your answerer. <laughs> can't they all be like that? Can someone else answer all the questions? <laughs> we do have another one, which is a really obvious question. How can the average Joe get involved in ensuring and supporting this to happen? Oh, we, clearly, you know, we're in a democracy. We put pressure on your local council, you know, talk to the right people. But the thing is, people don't forget, what people forget is that, you know, countries managed by governments and things for us, you know, like we are the ones that, that society's managed for. So you've got to speak, you've got to speak, you've got to get your voice out there, pressure in the right places, and be open and understanding. You know, one of the biggest barriers to getting cultural burning back on in Kakadu was that visitors hated the smoke, you know? Like, you know, what do you want the place? Completely ruined or do you want a bit of smoke? You know, like, you can also change your expectations and things like that. Like, there's a whole bunch of things you can do on a personal level, uh, opening conversations with people. Things just start, you know, just by um, spreading that kind of stuff and putting pressure in the right places. What are your thoughts on drone incendiaries for remote regions, perhaps in mosaic patterns, is a question that's come through. Yeah, it's great. Like, you know, humanity, humans, and this is, I always refer to this, we're all humans, you know, there's different cultures, but we're all, we're all humans. One of the, apart from fire, and fire's a perfect example of this actually, we take on and adapt and borrow and learn new technologies. You know, that's our skill. We've got a brain, we use it, we use it for planning, we use it for looking in the environment, learning lessons. You know, there's a theory out there, which I don't know if it's true or not, but that we learnt our mastery of fire off birds. You know, if you've ever seen those um, firehawks up in the top end, they'll grab a burning stick and drop it out into the bush and then pick off all the animals that run out. You know, we're observers and, and, and mimickers and we pick up technology. And, you know, there's an antiquated notion that cultural burning is only cultural burning if there's a black fella out there with a loincloth and a drip and a burning leaf, you know, which is not true. You know, we pick up technology. We use drip torches. We use rain dance machines, which are helicopters with incendiary devices, all these kinds of things. It needs, the way you do a cultural practice isn't the only thing that makes it a cultural practice. So I think, you know, in, in really remote areas where there's all sorts of different pressures and things now, we need to look at the toolkit. There's a question here. If we go back to the way things were managed, is there a chance that we won't get the same results because the environments and other factors like populations have changed so drastically? Yeah. Yeah, there's a chance of that, but there's also a chance if we don't, then we're just going to end up, you know, even further in the hole. You know, I think that the, we can't expect, and I'm not arguing for this, and anyone who does it, I think it's got rocks in their head, Landscapes aren't museums. Sorry, Science Gallery. <laughs> they're not museums, you know, like they're a living, changing thing. And we need to live and change with them. They're always changing. Now, what is it? Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, you know, in change, we find rest. You know, like it's, it's, that's the natural state of things. Things are changing all the time, right through, you know, the millions of years, right down to through the tens of years, all of these sorts of things. And we need to live and change and work with our world around us. And the thing about Cultural burning is it's following cultural protocols, cultural practice, following environmental cues. So it's sensitive to those changes to a degree. And we're not going to end up with the exact one-for-one -one likeness of what was there before because we've got things like fir trees and pine trees and da-da-da-da-da all over the shop. And we've got foxes and rabbits. And, but, you know, we still can get healthy country. And we can still get low fuel loads and all those sorts of things. 
I've got a, a question and a comment here. Uh, it says, Michael, your mum told me to watch. Thank you for your insight. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see that Aboriginal Australians can use science to enhance the way we they way they manage fire and pick the right time to burn? Oh, we already do. We're already, you know, mob everywhere are using drones, tablets, GPSs, all, you know, vehicles, um, rain dance machines, helicopters, all these sorts of things, you know, like, and I think, yeah, sure. You, as I said a moment ago, I mean, ignorant people ignore the advanced tools that they're, they're hand, or maybe not, you know, you get these people who are Luddite to do their thing, you know, like it's still hand pressing wine or whatever, and it's great, but like we're talking about uh, managing the continent here and we need to adopt new technologies. And I think that's a part of it, but I, I would hasten to say, let's not, there shouldn't be an over-reliance on remote sensing of climate variables and fuel moistures and all these sorts of things. The greatest cues are in the country around us. And not only does that tune us into what needs to happen, it connects us with country. And there isn't an example out there that when you connect with country, that you aren't healthier in your mind and your body. You know, and this is very, very important. This is a, we can use this as not only a tool to, to wrestle Australia back under control from its unravelling, but we can use it as a, as a way to connect with country and start you know, loving ourselves and loving the country we live in. Another question here. There's so many questions. Everyone's got questions. It's great. Uh, Michael, thank you for a brilliant talk. What things do you think could be done to encourage and support self-determination in land management and cultural burning? The whole, like there's a whole raft, it's like how long's a piece of string? There's these things need to be done in governance space. We need to get um, get people back on able into country, you know, like a lot of the land that I showed you, which is, you know, either owned or owned and controlled or just controlled by Aboriginal people in those maps. It doesn't cover much of the southeast, you know, like and this is country as well. Most Aboriginal people lived in the southeast exactly where we live now, you know. Nam or Melbourne and Birrung, the Yarra, were highly populated, you know, like desirable areas, you got an intersection of rivers and terrestrial and ocean, and who wouldn't want to live there, you know, uh, except when COVID comes along, I suppose. But, um, you know, we, we need to provide the mechanisms for people to get back on country. We need to recognise knowledge outside of the academy and outside of Western institutions. Um, and we need to empower people. We need to trust. Trust is a big thing. And when the media, and it's not you, Ray, when the media, <laughs> all you hear are bad stories about substance abuses, about abuse full stop, about bad luck stories, because media is just a, a parasite on the negativity of humanity, then, you know, it's hard for communities to build trust in Aboriginal people, whereas the vast majority of Aboriginal people are great knowledge holders, highly functional, all the, you know, they're people. You know, they're humans, they're modern humans. There's no difference anatomically or anything. Um, but, you know, when you're getting bombarded with these negative stories the whole time, trust is hard to build, you know. So there's a whole lot of, you know, as I said, it's, a, it's kind of a Pandora's box, if you like, that whole question. Wonderful. Well, unfortunately, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, Michael Sean. This has just been fantastic to be able to speak with you once again. Uh, and I also want to thank the Hugh Williamson Foundation and the Indigenous Knowledge Institute for making tonight possible. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and everyone who had questions. Uh, Michael, are you open to people contacting you on social media if they have further information that they would like to glean from you? Yeah, social media, or you can look me up. You'll find my email um, through the, fire, you know, the university, just type in University of Melbourne and yeah, shoot me an email and I'm happy when I've got time to respond. So don't expect a response that minute, but I'll definitely get back to you, I promise. <laughs> no worries. Now, this is the first in a series of conversations on First Peoples Fire Practice in collaboration with the Science Gallery Detroit, which is going to be announced very soon, which is very exciting. Thank you, everyone. Mandanguru and good night.